Good morning, church. I was glad when they said unto me, let us come into the house of the Lord. Please stand and worship the King together. to sing those words to kick off worship this morning because we're singing of his wondrous love. He is our shield and our defender, and he's worthy of our praise, and that's why we're here this morning to praise him and to thank him. Um, if you are our guest this morning, you're visiting with us for the first time, we'd like for you to pull out your cell phone and text the word welcome to this number on the screen, 865-234-3241. And this lets us connect with you, uh, lets us be able to give you a little bit more information about our church and uh, just to get to know you a little bit better. So if you will do that for us, we'd greatly appreciate it. We are just so glad you're here with us this morning as we continue to worship um, and as we enter a time of celebration, uh, believers baptism, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for your presence here this morning. Just help us to connect with you this morning, to hear the message that you have set aside for our hearts. Soften our hearts so that we can hear that message and apply it to our lives. Father, we just thank you for this one that's coming this morning believers baptism we just thank you for their example and we just pray that this is just an ongoing thing every every Sunday morning that we gather together that you will be continue to touch lives and to change hearts and to bring them in a, a faith in you it's these things we pray in your name amen uh, turn your attention now to the baptistry
let's continue in worship as we continue to celebrate the lives that are changed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we can consider all that he has done for us, we have to think about the holiness of God. We have to think about God the creator that existed before time, before space, and that he is good and that he is holy and that he loves us and he has made a way for us to be rightly related to him and that he is at work in all things. No matter the situation, no matter the problems that we face, he is bigger than all of that and is sovereign over all of that. Let's worship together.
we continue in worship, let us continue to celebrate salvation, that Christ has paid the debt for our sins that we could not pay, and he serves as our living hope as we follow after him and trust in him completely. Let's sing together.
Anybody who don't know me yet, I'm the pastor of discipleship. Our pastor, Dr. Green, is out of town this weekend, so he went to the bullpen for a left-hander. And uh, we're going to finish up this uh, seven-part series uh, called Love Hate. It's been out of Proverbs chapter 6, and uh, it's a short block of passage in the, in the wisdom scriptures. And uh, we've gone through the first six, and now I'm going to cap it off with the seven. So if you have your copy of God's Word, if you could stand in honor of the reading of God's Word, please do if you are able, and turn to Proverbs chapter 6. And the Word of God said, beginning in verse 16, The Lord hates six things. In fact, seven are detestable to him. Arrogant eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed blood, a heart that plots wicked schemes, feet eager to run to evil, a lying witness who gives false testimony, and one stir who stirs up trouble among the brothers. God, would you honor the reading of your word, the preaching of your text this morning by giving us open hearts that are tender to you. May we receive conviction, encouragement, and may it find itself in repentance and boldness to preach the gospel. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, in your household, you were probably discouraged by your parents, and you probably discouraged your own children from using strong emotional words like hate and detest. I mean, were you not? Did your parents say, don't say hate? You don't hate them. You just might dislike them quite a bit. Because hatred and, and detestability are such extreme emotional concepts that we know as parents and grandparents that it could down the road, if they start expressing themselves in that way, really do harm to their emotions and, and their relationships with people. Because words like hate and detest in our children, grandchildren, and even in our own heart are usually more detrimental to the hater than the hated. Because it becomes a, a dark, sinful, unhealthy emotion that will take hold of your heart and grow into something really, really bad. So we don't like our kids to use those words. We would rather they don't. So why can God use them? I mean, the world would ask that. As you're out sharing the gospel and, and they have these arguments against religion and against Christianity, they're going to ask you, well, it says God hates and he detests, really? I don't want to worship a God who hates and detests. So let me give you a quick apologetic on that and how to address it when people raise that or maybe in your own heart if you've had that question. Here's why it's okay for God to say he hates and detests. Our emotions are usually born from the flesh. They're, it's what wells up in us when our person, our um, personality, our heart has been hurt by someone or something and so the first thing that usually responds is our flesh so what wells up inside of us from the flesh as hatred and detestability is almost always in every case sinful because it came from the flesh and not from the spirit and so we need to really keep that in check our emotion is born out of pride flesh and the hope of evil to come to that person who offended us in some way I mean, like it or not, that's usually when we use the words hate and detest, it's our flesh speaking. That would be judgmental and sinful for us. God's emotions, on the other hand, are always governed by at least three attributes of his person. His sovereignty, his holiness, and his love. Ours are not governed by that like God's are. See, God can't be anything other than himself because he is holy sovereign and loving and perfect in all those ways God's hatred is due to his perfect holiness being offended we're just hateful because we got offended you hurt my feelings therefore I'm going to spew 
hatred and anger and, and detestability. Well, God's feelings aren't hurt. His holiness has been offended. His perfect holiness. God's hatred is always perfectly applied due to his sovereignty. And even God's hatred is rooted and governed by his love. It says he is love, so he can't be anything but that, even in light of these harsh emotions. So even his hatred is governed by his love, his sovereignty, and his holiness. God cannot and will not tolerate sin in his presence. His holiness can't allow it. That's the reason nothing of sin can enter into the eternal resting place of his children. He can't be in the presence of sin. Therefore, all of our sin had to be paid for that we might enter into eternity with him. God cannot apply hatred unjustly because of his sovereignty. Because of his sovereignty, everything he does is perfectly just. Therefore, even his hatred is sovereignly just. God always has as the goal of his hatred the love of his children, his church, and the kingdom. So love governs even God's hatred. While our emotions are never perfectly righteous, God's are always perfectly righteous. So why does that matter to us? Well, one, it, it doesn't give us the right to identify with these emotions just because God said he has them because they come from a different place. Ours come from flesh, his comes from perfection, holiness, sovereignty, and love. Therefore, we can't justify our hatred and our detestability because God had them. And so we can tell and explain to the wondering world why God's emotions are perfect and ours are not. So while he can express them perfectly, justly, sovereignly, lovingly, because we in almost all cases can never be like Jesus when the scripture says be angry and sin not I don't know about you but I can't remember many times when I'm angry that it wasn't sinful and that I didn't need to confess it and repent of it Jesus didn't because his emotions like the father's are perfect So now that we've placed these emotions within the parameters of a holy God, let's kind of recap what we've covered so far. We're going to put the first six things that says God hates on the screen. I think. God hates pride, loves humility. God hates impurity, he loves integrity. God hates injustice, he loves justice. God hates idolatry. God loves righteousness. God hates rebellion. He loves and honors obedience. God hates deceit. And he loves truth. Those are the six things it says in this passage in Proverbs 6. That God loves and hates. Now we're going to add number seven. The first six or. These, these seven, when you add this last one, God hates division, or one who stirs up trouble among the brothers, and he loves unity. When you add these six and look at the way it's used here in Proverbs, it's a Hebrew idiom in, the, in a discussion, guys, for Connect. It's explain this and use this every week so that you would understand how it's building. So the fir- in, a, in a Hebrew matter of speech, they would understand exactly what was going on when, when the passage started with these words. The Lord hates six things. In fact, seven are detestable for him. Six and seven, when they saw that phrasing, they would instantly know what was going on. It was an expression of speech that they would have, the audience would have understood to be six things he hates, yea, seven he detests, because the first six that he hates are what brings about the seventh. They would have known that. So all those first six, pride, impurity, injustice, idolatry, rebellion, deceit, Bring about division amongst the bride, his church. And so they would have known that right away. It was, it was put down in this form of expression so that it would be memorable. So that the audience would remember exactly what was said. They would have remembered those words. They would remember the phrasing. And they would know that that seventh one was the ultimate that was brought about by the first six. 
We wouldn't speak most of the time in this way, but the Hebrews did, and they would have known instantly what he was saying. The, the idiom is done for the purpose of remembering, and, and that's why it's done that way. The first five are all from emotions, really, and the last two are a particular kind of person. But also in this picture, this expression, look what God did. And he builds a picture of a person, so you can't depersonalize any of these sins because they're born in the heart of a person who God is judging and hates these things. But look what, look what they did. They built it from the head to the toes as they expressed these things that God hates. Pride, arrogant eyes, haughty eyes that are turned up. They express the attitude of the heart. Impurity comes from the tongue. He's talking about a person who, whose mouth overruns his brain when his heart's sinful. Injustice are the hands. Progresses to idolatry in the heart. Then ultimately rebellion in the feet. You see how he's drawn a picture head to toe with his words? He was very intentional for it to be memorable, to draw a picture so that we could identify as a person, as flesh, with all these things God hates and building to this detestable thing at the end called division. He does this so that we could internalize, confess, and repent if any or all of these things are a part of our lives. That makes sense? Very specific in, in how he's doing it. So let's look at the action step for this week. As we've looked at every week, it's called us to imitate these things that God loves. So in this last and seventh one, our action step is imitate the unity of Christ. Imitate the unity of Christ. Now, when you say imitate the unity of Christ, it's first within the Godhead, within the Trinity, his unity with God the Father and God the Spirit, and unified with God the Son. They are in perfect unity and harmony. So let's look at point number one. God hates division. He hates one that stirs up trouble amongst the brothers. He detests it. Now it's moved from hatred to the word detest in this seventh culmination of these sinful things because this one, when you add up the first six and detest the seventh, it literally makes God sick. And we're going to look at why that's so. Let's look at verse 19 again because the, the wording here is important. And one who stirs up trouble among brothers. Don't miss the wording. It doesn't say that God hates division. It says that he hates the one who stirs it up. You see, if, if he said God hates division, then we could separate that from a personal standpoint and say, well, you know, he hates division. No, you can't remove that from the person because it's the person who sins. And says God hates the one who stirs up trouble among the brethren. In other words, God hates a troublemaker. Within the context of his bride, within the context of his kingdom and church, he hates a troublemaker. And so there's a lot of reasons why. Division, troublemaking is sin. And as with all sin, he hates it because it hurts the one that he loves and it hurts his bride, the church. It's an offense to his bride who he sent his son to die for. Therefore, he detests it. Because of the price that was paid, the sacrifice that was made, when there's division amongst his people, it makes God sick in the depths of his spirit and his perfect perfection. He also knows the benefit of perfect unity because of his unity within, within the Trinity. Anything short of that grieves him because it doesn't allow us to reach our full kingdom value and productivity he left us with a job to do and division will stagnate that job it won't let the church have an effective witness and we'll look at that a little bit more so because it doesn't allow us to reach our full kingdom value and productivity the great commission in light of division is not as great as he desires it to be and the great commandment in light of division is not as loving as he knows it to be That's why he detests it because it hinders the work that he left his people here to do. 
any hint of division within us as his church and within the big C church hampers the mission taking the gospel to a lost and dying world we have to guard against that with everything that we are as we see in a moment division is detrimental to our witness most of all to a lost and dying world here's a convicting thought in light of our Christian witness how can lost sinners ever believe that God loves them God's children don't even love one another you ever thought about that I mean, if you go out and talk to the world, the unchurched, and ask them their opinion about the church and their experience with it or just maybe what they've heard about it if they've had no experience, one of the first things you'll hear is, that, well, those Christians fight all the time. Why well, don't want to be a part of that? Because you have fellowship church, and, and I'm not referring to any local thing, so understand something. Unity church, friendship, all these different fluffy names. Guess how the majority of them are started? vision most of them weren't planted out of a desire to spread church planting throughout the area one group got mad at another group words started flying opinions started being made and you had a church split and then the one who split off took a flowery name so that they could claim that they were the good part and what was left behind was the bad part I know it to be true some of us have been part of that and know people who are part of it why would the world think that God loves them when his children who say they love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength aren't even like each other? They're not unified. And it's a terrible witness to the world. It takes only one mean-spirited church member to cause division in an otherwise harmonious church body. What are the tools of this troublemaker? Pride. Gossip, lies, anger, a hateful spirit, a quarrelsome spirit, foolish questions. When, when, when this troublemaker stands up and starts asking foolish questions, just trying to stir up a hornet's nest, he identifies himself right away. He may as well put a tag on that says troublemaker. And we should identify him that way or her that way because there's nothing unifying about that. I'm not saying that questions are bad because they're not. We can ask questions for clarification and we should certainly hold church leadership accountable but we shouldn't ask foolish questions in order just to stir up trouble and to pull people to our opinion away from others. That's a troublemaker. All of us have been guilty at some time of either thinking that way or talking that way. The, the prideful person usually will bring his disruption in a public forum. But the more dangerous one is the one who spews his venom or her venom in the parking lot of the back hallways. Those are the troublemakers that cause the most trouble. If the troublemaker comes out in a public forum, then he will be seen by the body for what he is and somebody can bring him accountable to their actions. But when they go out in the parking lot or in the back hallways or in their supposed privacy of their Sunday school room and they spew the venom of division, then they have no accountability seemingly but they should have if you know somebody who's guilty of this here's a way to put a stop to it and they try to bring you into their divisive schemes because they'll always try to bring people into their little division party and so when somebody does that here's a way to stop it call them out call them out one on one they came to you spewing venom call them out if they're talking about a specific person or a decision that was made and they're being negative and divisive in their tone in their words call them out and say if it's if they're being divisive toward a person say well let's go to his office and talk to him he's I happen to know he's in right now so let's just go talk to him and settle this and make sure that we're you're, you're thinking right in the way you're saying these things or or if it's a decision that was made go to the person who made the decision if it was a body then go to the leader of that body or Call a meeting with the entire body and, and have a discussion, a loving discussion and call them out and bring it to light. It's sort of like when the cockroaches play at night and the lights are out. If no lights shed on it, they'll just continue to play and they'll invite all their buddies to play with them. And before you know it, 
You got them everywhere. Turn the light on. Now, I've done that a couple of times in my ministry, and even before I went into ministry, I had to do it. Walked up on the church porch, and, <clears throat> you know, you always had the group out front that were smoking and, and gossiping before the service. Uh, back in the day, I know we don't do that now. But walked up on the porch, and somebody caught me. It was a gentleman that was much senior to me, but he knew that I was a part of a lot of the committees and, and the lay leadership, and he started just really slamming the pastor because the pastor had been out of town on vacation. And he thought he still was. I knew he wasn't. I knew he was in his office. So when he started just going after the pastor with his tongue, I said, well, I'll tell you what. And, and, and the last thing he said before I chimed in was, and if he is here, I'd give him a piece of my mind. I said, well, I'll tell you what, he is. Let's go. I have never seen so much back tracking in my life he just about fell down the stairs he was standing on backtracking oh no no I, I don't want to cause trouble I said you already have I said so if you're not willing to go to the pastor and have a loving honest conversation about what you're so hateful about or in so much disagreement then I don't want to hear it anymore I don't want to hear it from you and I don't want to hear it from others who heard it from you because that's being divisive and you need to stop I had to do that twice. I was on budget and finance one time and, and uh, one of the members came to me during a ministry fair and I had a table out there for budget and finance committee and uh, this was before I was in ministry and I had a, a church member come to me and said, I just have one question. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, are you for us or for them? Well, I'd kind of like to think we were all the same. Us and them, we're in this together, and yes, I'm for us. And so I didn't share any names, but I did share the sentiment with the pastor. That morning, the next service, the pastor got up. I understand that somebody had some questions for budget and finance and uh, wanted to know if you were for them or us, and I just slid down <laughs> under the pew. But you know that person never addressed that with me again. And to the best of my knowledge, never addressed it with anybody again and continued on as one of our most faithful, generous, loving members. Still there. So you don't have to be adversarial, you don't have to be ugly, but we do have to speak truth and love and bring and turn the light on. Trust me, the cockroaches scatter when the light's turned on. You don't have to deal with it anymore so can i remind you god hates a troublemaker so when you encounter one lovingly call them out and make them deal with their situation in the correct way that the scriptures tell us to here's a caution flag for us if any of us finds ourselves being continually the one that this venom is being brought to in other words somebody's constantly gossiping to you about somebody else in the church or the leadership of the church or the pastor if somebody's constantly coming to you here's a warning flag what my former pastor called you have garbage can ears you have garbage can ears they only do that because they know you're receiving it and they'll let you that you'll let them dump their garbage in your ears if you call them out one time with your, with your and you'll stop that from coming to you because no matter hard if you just think you're listening in order to give people a vent don't it's harmful it's harmful to them it's harmful to the church it's harmful to your heart because once your ears fill up over and over again with their garbage or multiple people's garbage it affects your heart and it's difficult for you to walk out from under it and do what's right so call it out God hates division because it's the opposite of Christ likeness if left undealt with it will be the undoing of the church God loves his bride too much to let a troublemaker disrupt her, her mission but he expects his disciples to deal with it in a loving yet direct way in the words of the great theologian Barney Fife 
nip it in the bud. Call it out and see if it doesn't stop. And you may save that person from great spiritual distress down the road and bring them into right fellowship with the body of believers. It's just sometimes it's necessary to do the uncomfortable things. And the scripture gives us the guidelines to do it. There's, there's an old saying that I heard a long, long time ago. To live above with the saints we love, that will be glory. To live with below with the saints we know, that's a whole other story. <laughs> love people enough to call them out in a loving, direct, accountable way. And we will be able to walk more in unity. And one mean-spirited church member will not disrupt what otherwise would be full unity within the body to do the gospel work. What's the root of most division in the church? Mainly two things, opinion and preference. Why are they, why are they so dangerous? Because we all have them. I got opinions, I got preferences, you got opinions, you got preferences. You know where they fit in the body of the church? In the garbage can. Because opinions and preference are born out of fleshly things and have not been sanctified by taking them to the Lord in prayer. If you have somebody that comes to you and gives you their opinion or their preference, then take it for what it is and then, again, lovingly speak. Have you taken that to the Lord in prayer? Would, would you mind if I go to the Lord in prayer with you right now and let's just pray about this and over the next couple of weeks I would covenant to pray with you, you covenant to pray with me about this situation and let's hear what God says about it and then let's get together and talk and see where our hearts are. Once opinions and preferences have been sanctified by prayer then they can be offered as a word from the Lord but until then they're just flesh spilling out on the floor. We have to avoid that. And we all have them. And they're really strong in all of our lives. And they're from our experiences that we've had. But they're not from the experience with the Lord. So have that experience. And let him sanctify our opinions and our preferences. Then we can have a spiritual conversation instead of a worldly, fleshly conversation. That will bring unity and take away the troublemaker's playground. If we get, let me, let me illustrate it this way. Unbridled opinions and preferences are passed from ear to ear and grow worse with each passing discussion. It's sort of like a piano. And I'm the last musical person in this room, okay? But here's what I understand about tuning a piano. If you tune a piano... If, say if you have a room full of pianos, you're going to have a piano concerto, 12 pianos, let's just say. And you want them all to be in perfect unity, perfect harmony from a pitch standpoint. Then you tune every one of them from what? The same pitchfork. Every one of them. Because here's what's happened. If you tune the first one to the pitchfork and then tune the second to the 12th from the first piano, one little step off, as it gets to the end, it's going to sound like a horror movie instead of a concerto. So every piano in that group must be tuned to the same tuning fork. It's just the way they do it and the way it should be done. That's what prayer is. You see, if we're tuning our words to the opinions of 12 people, every time that passed from mouth to ear down 12 people, it got worse. And by the time you got to the end, it was something evil, not just off a little. It was evil. But prayer, prayer, people who get on their knees in, in regard to a situation is like tuning to the same tuning fork. We're all going to the same God in the same way with hopefully the same heart to reconcile our heart to God's heart. And when we get to the end of that spiritual tuning fork, situation and come back together we should be speaking in concert from our spirit not our flesh make sense these are all ways that we have to focus on in order to avoid division prayer controls the tongue 
Let's look at what James, the most straight talk, practical theologian in the New Testament. Let's see what he says about prideful opinions in an unbridled tongue. James 1.26, if any of these won't be on the screen. If anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless and he deceives himself. Strong word. Loving though. James 3, 13 through 18. Who among you is wise and understanding? By his good conduct, he should show that his works are done in the gentleness that comes from wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast and deny the truth. Such wisdom doesn't come from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. James, don't mince words. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there's disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy, good fruits, unwavering without pretense, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. May we all be peacekeepers, peacemakers, who only proceed from much prayer, because God hates the one who causes division. That takes me to point two. God hates division. God loves unity. He loves unity because it's the perfection of his relationship with the Son and Spirit. By us imitating this relationship, he will be glorified and his mission will be accomplished if we're unified in spirit. Under the second point, I'm going to let the word of God do most of the speaking and do what it does best. It convicts and reconciles us children to the heart of the Lord Jesus. Here's just a few passages that speak of the benefits and results of unity. James 3.18, I mentioned this earlier at the end of that passage, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. Psalm 133.1, behold, how good and how pleasant is it, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Ephesians 4.3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Here's, here's a little interesting tidbit for you, a little contrast. The seventh description of, of a wicked man, and that's what this passage in Proverbs 6 is. It's a description of a wicked man. You have descriptions of wise men and wicked men. This is a wicked man description. The seventh description of the wicked man who is one who's a troublemaker. Jesus' seventh beatitude describing a godly man is blessed are the peacekeepers in Matthew 5, 9. God hates a troublemaker. Jesus says, God loves a peacemaker. Now, peacemakers and peacekeepers are different people. Peacekeepers will keep the peace at all costs, including compromise. That doesn't make peace. That keeps peace. We don't want to keep peace because it's blistering under the the surface, ready to well up again in in anger and bitterness. We want to make peace. We want to put it to an end. (coughs) We want to deal with it. Biblically, lovingly, directly, so that peace is made, not just kept for it to rise its head again. What's it look like to be a peacekeeper? Romans 12, 9 through 18. Let love be without hypocrisy. Detest evil, cling to what is good. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Take the lead in honoring one another. Do not lack diligence in zeal. Be fervent in the spirit and serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints in their needs. Pursue hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible... This is verse 18, Romans 12. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. We can't control others. We can control us. As far as it depends on you, Paul says, live at peace with everyone. Philippians 4, 8, and 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you first Corinthians 1 10 
I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there will be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Now I want to move forward in, in scholarship to the 20th century with Francis Schaeffer, who's just brilliant. Francis Schaeffer, these are several quotes by him. Francis Schaeffer said, the final apologetic for the world is the unity of the church. Think about that. Think back to the question earlier. Why would the world want to believe that God loves them when his people don't even love each other? Francis Schaeffer frames that in this statement. The final apologetic for the world is the unity of the church. What does he mean by that? Well, let me read a couple more quotes out of the same work. Schaeffer says, I am convinced that in the 20th century, people all over the world will not listen if we have the right doctrine or the right polity, but are not exhibiting community within the church. Schaeffer says, the world's not going to listen. When all we show is disunity <coughs> and a lack of love, why should they? Schaefer goes on to say, our love will not be perfect, but it must be substantial enough for the world to be able to observe, or it does not fit into the structure. Or the verses in John 13, which is where Jesus washes the disciples' feet, and John 17, when he prays his high priestly prayer at the end of his life. And if the world does not observe this among true Christians, the world has a right to make two awful judgments, which these verses indicate. Speaking of John 13 and John 17. Here's what the world can rightly judge when they see disunity among the church. That we are not Christians and that Christ was not sent by the Father. Because in John 13 and John 17, those are two attributes of a Christian and the fact that God was sent or Christ was sent by the Father. So if they don't see unity among the church, they can rightly judge those two statements. That we're not Christians and that Christ was not sent by the Father. Why does God hate division? Just another really hard example. He hates it because it allows a watching world to rightly judge that we are not his disciples and that Christ was not sent from God. They want to believe that anyway. And we give them a reason by our disunity. Why does God love unity? Because it proves to the watching world that we belong to God and we are his disciples. We are the disciples of Christ and Christ was sent by the Father to save a dying world from sin. Why does he hate division? Because it allows the world to rightly judge us. If the Apostle Paul and Francis Schaeffer weren't enough, then I want to close with these prayerful words of Jesus from John 17. As he prayed for the disciples who would be saved through the message of the gospel throughout all time. John 17, verse 20 through 23. Jesus said, I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their message. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be one in us so that the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me. May they be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. If we're to be a kingdom people with the goal of fulfilling the great commission and the great commandment, which is what we're called to do, we must pursue and preserve unity at all costs, including the uncomfortable ones. May we trust God and do the work of building true community before a watching world as we imitate the unity of Christ. In just a second, so Alyssa's gonna come up and lead us in a song of response and the altar is open. The word's been pretty clear. It's not ambiguous in this statement. God hates division and loves unity. So this will be a time for all of us to respond as the Holy Spirit moves in your heart, convicts you. And this is not a time to necessarily pray for someone else. This should be a personal time to pray for our own hearts, to cast out all division and replace it with all love. In the hope of having a church that is perfectly in unity with the Spirit, that the world might know that Christ came from the Father and that God loves them. Let's pray. Lord, your word is clear. It's loving. It's, it 
it's convicting. Lord, may it move our hearts to weeping, to brokenness. And would we, would that we would respond with confession and repentance that we might be unified. Lord, if there's anyone here that we've, we're in current state of division with, I pray that those relationships would be reconciled this week, one-on-one -on -one in love with humility and that it would be responded to with forgiveness so that we could walk hand in hand with the Spirit of God and take the gospel to the world. So Lord, as the Spirit speaks, I pray your people move in Christ's name. Amen. seated as we continue to worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings and just a reminder that there are boxes on the columns as you leave the worship center for you to drop your offering in if you desire to do it that way or you can text give to 865-234-3241 and you will get a link to give online makes it very very convenient so let's worship good morning church family let's pray together Father, we thank you for a place to gather and to worship your name, to lift it high, to stand united as Christians across this planet, worshiping the one true God. And Father, we pray that as, as everybody gives this morning and opens their hearts to how they can serve financially, how they can commit to helping spread the gospel across the world, Father, that you would find us generous. God, we thank you for everything that you give us and for the chance to give just a portion of it back to you. Bless the gifts, bless the giver. In Jesus' name, amen. While our students have gotten to know Pastor Kirk really well with him coming to speak at our camps the past two years and at our Haybell Hoot Nanny last year, it was awesome to finally make it up to Cincinnati to get to partner with Pastor Kirk and uh, everything that God is doing through him and Revive City Church up there in Cincinnati. And while we got to do a variety of, of different projects and things to help out uh, the church and even got to partner with a local ministry, 
uh, that, that feeds the homeless under the bridge there in Cincinnati. Our primary purpose there was to help lead a vacation Bible school. Uh, here in Knoxville, you can go on every corner almost and see a vacation Bible school or a backyard kids club. Uh, but it's a little different up there where uh, most kids in this area where we got to help serve uh, don't really get that opportunity. And vacation Bible schools are definitely much more rare in that area. And so it was awesome for uh, the kids in that area to get to experience Spark Studios, to get to see that they were created in Christ and made for uh, a purpose. And so uh, it was amazing to see our students to, to step in and to, and to lead the, the songs and the motions, to teach them through Bible studies and the crafts and even times of recreation. And uh, just to get to do all of that while in Cincinnati. And so it was an amazing week for our students, for our leaders, uh, and for that community. And we would definitely encourage you that anytime you see a Cincinnati trip coming to uh, definitely uh, consider going to partner with Pastor Kirk because uh, I know there's a lot to still be done up there and he loves mission teams. And so I know that there's, there's a team that's going in September uh, and future teams that will be going uh, in the future. And so we encourage you to partner with Pastor Kirk and Revive City Church and everything that God is doing up in Cincinnati. All right, I just want to remind you that because of your generosity, our Students are able to go and help with our church plant partners in Cincinnati. They had a great week, uh, except for the ride back home in a bus with no air conditioning and 100 degree heat. So uh, they made it. Nobody flaked out, but they had to stop several, several times. Uh, so glad they made it back safely. Thankful for Matt's leadership. And, and uh, when we give, it makes these things possible to help people literally around the world in our missions and ministry. So a couple of announcements before we dismiss. One next week is back to school Sunday, prayer walk Sunday. Wear your uh, local high school colors of your choice. Uh, it's always a, a fun time. Uh, there is a D group training next Sunday afternoon after church, 1230 in the Kids Center. Uh, please RSV to uh, discipleship at WMBC.net. If you're going to come to that, we're going to have a lunch and then about a two hour regroup and relaunch of D groups to pull everything back in and to, this is especially for those who have been in D groups, uh, and because we need to keep the DNA pure, pull everybody back to a, a plumb line of what they're supposed to look like, but also for people who are interested in D groups. And then in Catalyst, starting October 19th, we'll have a D group uh, lab to where we'll actually participate in mock D groups so that people who haven't been in D groups will see what they are. So please take advantage of that next Sunday. I know it's Prayer Walk Sunday, but Prayer Walk, isn't limited to 20 minutes after church, okay? You can go any time of the day and prayer walk at your local school. So would love to have you at the, the uh, D group training. Also, <clears throat> the Catalyst listings are out for the fall. They're available in the Breezeway Foyer, in the Source, and at the Welcome Center. And so please take advantage of that. Pastor John will be back next week when we'll start our Join the Mission series. It's our annual series that we do this time every year to bring us back to the Be Disciples, Make Disciples mission and regroup around that and try to get clarity in our communication, try to get movement in our feet, try to get alignment around that mission, and then see everything that God desires to happen. You've heard your mission. You're now sent to Knoxville and the nations.